I feel like when you think of the word recovery and it's like time to heal, right? And you feel like recovery should end, right? At some point, like, oh, yeah. I feel better. I'm back. And I'm like, you know what, though? And I think one of the, the nurses said it perfect is you died. <laughs> You know, there, that's the thing that like you you can talk to almost anybody and start your conversation off that way. And they're not going to know how you feel. It's very rare. You can yeah. actually talk like you and I have this conversation and we've both been through the ultimate same thing where we were gone. Welcome, everyone, to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project and uh, to our very first episode. My name is Yelis Vaz and I am a sudden cardiac arrest survivor. Now, I started this project to help provide tips and support to cardiac arrest survivors through articles that you can find on the websites and conversations with cardiologists and fellow cardiac arrest survivors such as Jamie Bowden here on our first episode. I sincerely hope that you as a fellow cardiac arrest survivor or, well, if you're someone who actually has uh, someone close to you who is a cardiac arrest survivor, that you will take time to listen to these conversations and also check out uh, everything on the website to hopefully also help you to feel less alone through this wild roller coaster or to understand it better what we cardiac arrest survivors go through. That is my intention and my goal with this project. As a survivor myself, I, I know how lonely it can get and uh, yeah, it can be a really crazy roller coaster. Therefore, the, yeah, that I also felt this need to create a place to provide emotional support for fellow sudden cardiac arrest survivors. Now, in this episode, in this first episode, I talk with fellow cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior Jamie Bowden about the time he had a cardiac arrest, how he survived it and who saved him. We also talk about Jamie's experience with PTSD, survivor's guilt, any tips and advice he would like to offer other survivors, and uh, just many, many more things. If you like this episode, be sure to follow the podcast to be notified when the next episode comes out. Uh, in the description of this episode, there you can find a link to the show notes. And in the show notes, any resources mentioned, such as book recommendations, uh, in this conversation that can be found there. Having said all that, I truly hope you will gain something from this conversation and that my intention of providing support through them will be one you may experience. Jamie, yes. a warm welcome here to the Heart Warrior podcast. I am honestly really grateful that, that you took the time to do this. Well, thank you for bringing it to everybody's attention. I watched your uh, YouTube of your seven things you learned and there was oh. things word for word that you said that I would have exactly have said almost identical. And like you said, there's some things that are different because we all have different experiences and, th and thoughts from what we went through with the sudden cardiac arrest. But um, yeah, it was, I felt like it was like, I, this is my chance to get out there and help. I'm glad that that video actually was able to help uh, uh, some people like you, for example. Uh, but I'm sure that you have a lot of your own lessons, right? Yes. Uh, so I'm curious to to just uh, know them myself and for any other sudden cardiac arrest survivors uh, listening, right? And I guess the best place to just start is where this journey kind of started for you, right? Like the day when you had your sudden cardiac arrest. Like, can you share with us what when that happened? And also just like... How did you survive it? Like, who saved you? Well, um, it was July 26th, 2020. It was a Sunday. And um, the, now, I don't remember the day. <laughs> so a lot of what I'm saying is what I I was told what happened. So the morning we had a celebration for my daughter's birthday. Um, and I honestly just, I know we had it, but I don't remember anything of that morning. We went to one of our friend's house for a barbecue. There was a friend from out of town that we all grew up with. And not one time did anybody see me act different, complain, nothing, just like a normal everyday, you know? So we went to leave. It was me driving my wife in the passenger seat and our two kids who are at the time were um, nine and 11 and uh, I'm sorry, uh, eight and uh, 10. And we were less than a mile from home. We were close. So it was a, a local trip. And, as I made a left onto a street that was a two lane with like a painted 
uh, median in the middle. The, my wife, Alma, noticed that the car kind of veered to the, a little bit. And she just looked up at me and her exact <laughs> words were, you were gone. Like th- you, there was no noise, no anything from me, no gasp for breath. She's like, it was like you were just gone. And she was able to yeah. wrestle the car over yeah. the side of the road with me driving. <laughs> That's so crazy. <laughs> Get the kids off the side of the street. And as this is going on, it's going to start raining because it was a, a, like a thunderstorm was coming. So we, um, she immediately, 911, she couldn't move me. I mean, I'm 6'2". I'm, she's small. You know, she's like, I can't get them out. So she just put the seat back and started compressions. And um, like most calls, it feels like forever until somebody responds. And it just so happened that there was a uh, police officer in the area. And when he showed up, they were equipped with an AD and he looked at me and he said, we're not moving them. We're going to lose time. I'm just hooking this thing up. And that's what started a little bit of a pulse going, but I still wasn't on my own. I was still out of it, struggling to try and keep anything going. And then shortly thereafter, the fire department showed up. They had to shock me numerous times. I was actually on the Lucas machine on the way to the hospital, which is to simulate CPR as you're going. So, um, I was just a critical patient going into the hospital. Like they, like I work for the village. So I know the, like a lot of these guys know me from work and, uh, they all honestly said, like when they took me there and dropped me off, they didn't know what was going to happen with me. You know, they did their part to get me there. And then of course, when I was in the hospital, it, you know, induced coma, I would life support. I did the, um, uh, the the bath and the ice to keep my temperature down uh, for to you know I, from when I researched into it it helps to lose that you don't lose as much you know brain loss during the time when your body's suffering lack of oxygen. Wait, that's what that they that, that's what they did in, in the hospital? hospital. Yeah, I never heard of it before, oh, okay. um, and it uh, apparently so, worked because I'm pretty minus the short term loss and some things of the the time that I was out. I I don't have yeah. a lot of memory damage I, I there is some things a little different afterwards but w- way better than what it could have been from because they estimated i was about 11 to 14 minutes completely without any kind of support of oxygen going to my brain on me that's wild yeah so it was, it was i was down i mean i was gone there was no doubt that i was if i would have been in any other situation that day i would have not made it i would have i would have passed <laughs> You know, and your your kids were in, in the, the car, car too. Yeah, they were there. They well, got your whole side. family. Yeah, they, was ever it was unbelievable what my wife, what she did. Yeah, and so, yeah. Just fast forward real quick. When it all happened, and after we talked about it, she said it was so frantic. I was running around. I didn't have my shoes on. You know, she's it was just crazy. And when the battalion chief came to one of my son's birthday parties. When the, this was all during COVID too, so they're still doing the drive-by birthdays and things. The guys who handled my call were on shift, and they were able to come to my son's birthday. And this was not too long after it happened. Within a like a month span of this happening, is when they had the birthday party. And the battalion chief told my wife that you handled the situation so well that it was a perfect call. We've been to piece of people's house who stub their toe, and there's more trauma going yeah. on than Whoa. a cardiac victim. That's your husband. You know, they're lifeless. You Where know, every so second it was, counts. Yes, it was, and it was so reassuring for her to hear those words because you know when you're a first responder, you're you're kind of wired a little differently. You know, you see things all the time. Yeah. You do things that most people never envision, and she's thrown in the middle of all of it at the same at that moment. You know. So it was really um, traumatic for me because I, I didn't remember any of it. You know, when I woke up, you know, a couple of days later when they got me out of the coma, um, I just looked around. I was in the ICU and I'm like, wow, something bad happened. Mm, <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, I, same something's right. Not uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> something's not right. And I kept uh, thinking to myself, well, maybe I, I'm not sore. Nothing's broken. You know, I didn't I wasn't in an accident or anything, but um, I was just lost like i didn't really know what happened and then when they told me the story of what happened i was in tears because my first thought was my kids witnessed this my wife had to go through this and i I was floored i I, I didn't know what to think I, i was blessed and scared all at the same time 
And then this enormous gratitude took over because of how much I almost lost everything at 45, you know, and I, and I'm like in front of my children, <laughs> you know? And so it was really, a, it was a, a, a very amazing event, but scary all together at one, at one time. And, and it's a miracle. I mean, and it took me a while to admit that, but it was a miracle that it happened the way it did. We didn't get into a car accident. Um, you know, I could have easily hit another car and they could have looked at me and thought I just got knocked out, you know, and they wouldn't have known the fact that I was there, you know, lifeless because as you know, cardiac arrest, you just shut off. Yeah. yeah you know, there's, you're unconscious. there's really no support system made for it. You know, you just, you're done until somebody can give you CPR or get a shock to you, you know, it's just scary. And I didn't know anything about sudden cardiac arrest before any of this. So I, I, I heard stories of people passing away from cardiac arrest, but I never, it never affected any of us to research, you know, and it was shocking to hear that, that you can completely be healthy, no issues. And all of a sudden something triggers in you to decide to shut that heart off and you're done, you know, and like I said, <laughs> thank God we were in the situation we were in, even though it was weird to be driving. Um, it worked out. That's probably the only way I could have survived is the situation that we had to go through, you know? Wow, man. Uh, I mean, a lot of things in a way, uh, I, I recognize, right? Uh, it, mm -hmm. it, I have a different story, of course, but it's still intense to hear someone else story, you know, and, yes. and big kudos to your wife, to your wife. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. A true hero, heroic act. That's that's incredible, actually. It it starts with her. I mean, that that's yeah. the, her identifying it and starting the CPR was step one in order for me to make it. You know, and everything else took its process the way it was. And then even in the hospital, there was doubts with them as well on whether or not you know I was going to make it. Uh, you know, they did what they could. I was trying to recover, and they basically said it's kind of up to his body now to pull out and, and, and make it, you know, and I keep feeling like I, I didn't do anything because I don't remember it, but obviously part of it was me, you know, it wasn't my time, but uh, I was just, it was very overwhelmingly emotional that it affected a loved one in, its, in a way where, like you said, my children were there and I, I just could not put my arms around this, the whole thing until we kind of both started talking more about it. But, um, I'm like, oh, I don't know. How do you deal with that? <laughs> you know, but that was my first thought. I'm like, what, what, what do you, what do you go from there? You know? So I know yeah. it's a lot to take in, right? <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. So, but uh, like, do they know why it happens? Like, do you have a heart disease or, or well, did they figure something out? When I first, when I met my cardiologist at the hospital, he kind of explained that they're, that I went into AFib. So something triggered my heart to go into full AFib. And he goes, you were full gone, You're like 200 plus, you know, your heart was completely just in compulsion. It wasn't pumping. It wasn't doing anything. Um, and he said, we're going to put the ICD in you. Uh, that was, I was there for a week. That was the Friday of that week that I had it done. And he goes, that is your safety net. So if you were to have it again, it's not going to end the way it did. This will bring you back. And I go, oh, okay, well, that's good to know. You know, I'm like, uh, is there a manual with this thing or something? You know, <laughs> would, well, you know, and that was the one thing that was weird is that I had all this, you know, near death experience in, in the hospital and the doctors were great, but nobody really told you what to expect. You know, know. You, it was yeah. kind of like, you're going to go home. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I remember sitting on my couch and looking at everything and just being so grateful that I'm still here to enjoy my TV, my everything. It's like, Oh, you know, and there was nothing, I didn't even know what like a shock would feel like, you know, not, it was nothing like explained to me other than the fact that when it kicks in, you're going to know it. Cause from what I've told, it's pretty painful when it, if you get a jolt, you know, so you didn't have one yet, right? Hmm? You didn't have a shock or anything from the ICD. No, I didn't. No. I, Cause okay. um, yeah. thankfully the, the shocks and everything I went through, I was, out and I, I I was sore when I woke up from the event, but it wasn't memorable to me. So I didn't. I haven't had any incidents with the ICD in after the fact um, until recently. I started having 
I started having some issues. But so anyway, to answer your question, when I left, there was really no diagnosis of what exactly happened. Um, you know, the doctors, you know, they were monitoring me. They wanted me to do a, um, um, a, a cardiac MRI. And I was having a bunch of issues trying to get back into the hospital to do anything. I, I was, when I left the hospital, even going to the doctor's office, and it was even in a different hospital, I immediately went in and I, I was getting nervous and I was just having a hard time dealing with a hospital scene, you know? So I just told him, I said, listen, I'll make an attempt <laughs> to try and do it, but I don't think I can, but let's just try it. And I tried one time. And as soon as I found out that they shut the device off while you're in the machine, I'm like, I, I can't do it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm going to freak out. I'm going to waste your time. So the doctor said, well, you're, everything you're doing is okay. Like we're not seeing any signs of anything. So just keep coming in for your checkups. If something feels wrong, they'll tell, you know, it tells them, you know, when we, it reads our, we're basically monitored all the time, right? I mean, he can look at the screen and see where I've, I've been walking, working out, you know, they see everything on there. We're real cyborgs, and, um, right? Right, exactly. It's yeah. really weird to think that. Yeah. And uh, I kept telling him, I'm like, well, I feel healthy. And I, I mean, I, I feel different. I definitely can tell something happened because, you know, I do have a little more fatigue at times. My body feels like it's been through the ringer, you know, with the trauma. And, you know, I remember getting the insurance bill and looking at the amount of medicine they had a pump in me. I'm like, well, you know, all those things have some kind of side effects at some point. Like that something is going to take effect to affect me in recovering. Um, so really, for a while, I didn't know what happened. I, I had really no explanation. It was more that I know that I had an electrical issue with my heart that triggered it to go to AFib. It was, there was nothing evident to them. They did an angiogram when I was out and my heart itself was as healthy as can be. They had no blockages, no anything. So that was, you know, nice. And I'm actually kind of glad they did it when I was out because I didn't even know they did it until I woke up and saw a bandage and I'm like, Oh, what's that from? And like, we did an angiogram. I'm like, Good. I don't remember it. <laughs> like, I'm glad I was out. Here. So, um, and then later on, I, I started having some issues, and I actually had a in the end of this end of May of this year, I actually went into AFib again, and I was about a millisecond from getting shot. Really? So yeah. So now I, you know, they told me that it's that the VT issue with the PVCs where they kind of pulsate to the heart and almost attach your heart. It sends it into AFib. And I'm on medicine now. Um, so I'm taking a uh, Sotolo to control my heart rate and keep it down, which is good. It's very strange because I'm pretty active and to not be able to elevate my heart rate like you do usually when you're active mm -hmm. feels like you have a governor on you all the time. It's very, mm -hmm. it's weird. But if it saves me from going through. So the second time I had it, Again, I was driving and I was by myself this time at work and um, I had the whole feeling of getting ready to pass out and it was scary because how, I... How many years were between the cardiac arrest almost, and that event? Uh, would have been almost just under two years, believe it or not. Yeah, it was just under two years because I would have been... My two-year anniversary was this July and it was the day after Memorial Day. Yeah. when it happened this time around. And I'm going to be honest with you, there was a couple of times where I was feeling a little off here and there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have an iPhone watch like most people or something that's tracking your heart rate. And I had a few times where it elevated, but I never got a call from a doctor saying, okay. hey, we saw this. Uh, this is concerning. Um, even when I go in for my checkups, they would see something on there. And it was a very small jump. It was n n nothing to say, well, this is what we probably should start doing. But when I had this one, I remember, um, again, I was scared when I had it, my first instinct, because I just wanted to be home. I probably should have called 911 and, and got checked out. But I'm like, you know what, I just want to be home where I feel safe. And I'll call the doctor. And as soon as I call the nurse's station call that monitors the device. And she said, Can you send us a message? And then she saw the whole thing to the second of what happened. And she goes, I'm going to leave a note for the doctor and expect a call from a nurse to schedule, schedule an appointment or they'll want to talk to you or something. And the doctor called me and goes, you need to come in. So I knew right there and then I'm like, okay, this is something happened serious again, you know. And that's when um, he, he mentioned 
the possibly needing an ablation in the future, you know, if the medicine seems to not control it. Um, but he, he's happy with what the medicine's doing. And, and I feel like it's helped a, a lot as far as I don't feel those rushes anymore like I used to, even though some of that is I'm also working on trying to, con, you know, keep stress down, do things that, you know, help my you know mental state as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was a long time before I had the second incident which was amazing to me because to be honest with you, the first incident scared me, but the second one frightened me because I felt the feeling of going unconscious, losing my, like, you know how you feel like you kind of like you're going to pass out and like your legs turn into like a thousand pounds, you know, and it just scared me to no end. And I said, listen, something's got it. I have to get to, I can't go through life worried about getting shot. Yeah. Or, or having this sometime when I'm in the car, because that was my first thing when I was driving. I went back and kind of re-stepped where I was, and I almost went like two full blocks, hmm. opposite side of the road. Okay. And thankfully, no cars were coming. Yeah. Nobody was walking. No nothing. And I went home, and again, I avoided the car for a while. <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm not going to be driving anytime soon, you know. Um but then I got back into it because, you know, you got to be able to have a life, right? I mean, it's like... You got to go on in a way, right? <laughs> right, yeah. You just want to sit so, in a chair all day. Exactly. Uh, so I am, I am kind of getting back to doing some normal things. But there's always... And I, I mean, I think I, you kind of related to it when I was listening. There's a little bit of a restriction yeah. mm -hmm. in you afterwards. Um, and I know it's different for everybody. Some people, it's more restrictions and fears or whatever you want to call it. And then to me, it's a change. I, there's just an internal change in me <laughs> to where things I used to do at a snap of the fingers are harder for me to want to go do it. Or I feel like I can't, or I feel like, you know, what if something does happen? Mm -hmm. And it's very weird to have those thoughts when you're kind of more used to being carefree yeah. and able to do things, you know, whenever you want to do it. And, yeah. um, that's been the hard, one of the hardest parts about recovering is I feel like when you think of the word recovering, it's like time to heal, right? And you feel like recovery should end, right? At some point, like, oh, yeah. I feel better. I'm back. And I'm like, you know what, though? And I think one of the, the nurses said it perfect is you died. <laughs> you know, there, That's the thing that like you, you can talk to almost anybody and start your conversation off that way. And they're not going to know how you feel. It's very rare you can yeah. actually talk like you and I have this conversation and we've both been through the ultimate same thing where we were gone. We we had a bookmark in our life right there, you know. Right. And it's yeah. yeah. And um I said, Well, yeah, I guess you're right. And she was like, So <laughs> everything's gonna be different. And that's okay. You know, that's that's it, there's no reason to look for excuses for it. You had something that is ultimately life changing to anybody, you know, and it it I'll go back to when it first happened and I was in the hospital. I remember the nights when I, because it was, like I said, during COVID. So everybody in ICU was, all I saw was this, you know, there was no, they're in their full garb and I can only have one person at a time. And it was mostly my wife. She would always be there. And when she had to leave, it was so lonely. And I just remember thinking about how close I came to losing everything. And I, it just, it was so overwhelming that I, I was thinking about even like childhood stuff that I did. <laughs> and then I, th I kept thinking to myself, like, what I've been, I'm happy in life and I lived a good life, you know, something I didn't come back, but I'm back, <laughs> you know? So I'm like, now what? Like, what does this, what does this mean? Is, is it, uh, uh, you know, I, before I wasn't non-faithful, but I wasn't, following i wasn't you know a church every sunday type of person but um i read the bible daily now and it was part of my recovery was to get into faith you know and um the best thing it gave me was peace during a time when i needed it and i and i'm always thankful for that and again it's what helped me and it's different for everybody so it's not like i have found a, a key to the like of getting through things because i know a lot of people I, from reading stuff uh, on the survivors that leaned on their faith completely walked them through helping a lot of it now i didn't have that before and i found it afterwards so it was a little different for me um but there was really no 
you kind of got, here's what's going on. You're going home tomorrow. And you just leave. It, it just, there's a lot of times where you felt alone because you didn't know where to turn or who to talk to or what kind of person could deal with something like this. And it's hard to talk to family because they're part of mourning what you went through. You know, um, I, it crushed me to see my mom afterwards because she took it really hard and it scared her. And I could see it in her eyes that, you know, she, had a glimpse that scares everybody when they talk about a loss of a child. You know, it's one of the hardest things you could go through. And it was kind of uncomfortable for both of us at the time to talk about it or even mention it because it was automatically emotions, you know, and um, it, 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 you do feel alone, but there is things out there to kind of help you. You sometimes have to find it because it's you it's kind of up to, up to you to find it, but it's difficult because there's no, there when you leave to say hey this is who you should go see or talk to or there's a group here to go talk to somebody you know it's just like hey uh have a safe trip home there, there's <laughs> few guidelines way. to follow right and yes what do you do with that knowledge what do you do with knowing that you died and how do you go on from there right Hey, my apologies for interrupting the conversation. It will just take a moment. If you like the conversation so far and would like to support the Heart Warrior Project, check out the truly awesome looking t-shirts and mugs I created together with an illustrator for fellow Heart Warriors. My goal in creating the t-shirts and mugs was to create something that would help me feel more empowered in the battle that surviving this cardiac arrest has been and, well, still is in many ways to show not only the world, but also myself, the heart warrior that, that I have become. And by offering the t-shirts and mugs on the Heart Warrior Project, I too hope that it can help fellow cardiac arrest survivors feel empowered too. The mug has become my go-to mug. I, I drink my coffee from it every morning and my tea throughout the day. Also, the t-shirts I personally love so much that I ordered more than a couple of them myself. I frequently wear one throughout the day and uh, certainly you can see me wear the t-shirt when I'm out climbing. I can only say this, have a look at the t-shirt designs and the mugs. And if you like what you see, I tell you, you won't regret ordering either the t-shirt, the mug or both of them. Not only will you have a fitting mug and or t-shirt for your current lifestyle, but you'll also be supporting the Heart Warrior Project and help me to continue doing this. In the description of this episode, you can find a link that will take you to the page where you can order both the t-shirt and the mug, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find it. All right, thanks for taking a moment to listen. Now let's return to the conversation. You shared a bit already about your recovery. Uh, so maybe let me just jump to another question then, like in which ways, and there's a very obvious ones, right? Like having an ICD and a medication, but in which other ways like did your life change uh, a lot? And what have been maybe some very difficult changes? And maybe you already shared partly a bit about like going somewhere and already thinking about it before going somewhere. That's already a major change, right? But have there been yeah. other ones? Um, well, I think so. The ICD is a change in itself because it's always there. Yeah. Right. It's your always reminder. Um, yeah. Every day. I think every day you yeah. feel it sometimes. Some days it feels a little weird, like something's going on in there. Or, you know, I, I was playing catch with my son in the backyard the other day yesterday mm. we were playing catch with the football and it just happened to slip up and hit that area and, it, and if something hits that thing ouch it hurts <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it hurts yeah and um i think the biggest change for me was embracing the feeling of people asking how you're doing all the time you know like feeling like you're the one like because you you're like we don't look like something, tr like if somebody hears our story, they're shocked. That's the first thing I get. People are like, Re what? Really? You know, and you almost kind of feel like a victim in a sense of something that it's like, well, no, 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 I I'm, I'm good. You know, things are good, but I'm okay. I'm just trying to get through it. Like that was my, yeah. well, I think my every line I've said a thousand times to people that they'll say, well, how are you doing? And I'm like, I'm getting through it. I'm alive today. You know, that was my, always my thing is I'm alive today. That That's what matters is. I embrace the day mm. because I know what it's like to not have a guaranteed tomorrow, you know? Yeah. Um, 
and as far as a change goes, it, it's been hard to slow down a little bit. Um, just because I feel like I have to, you know, I, cause I, I, I can push myself to a, a point, but I'm always in the back of my mind knowing that, Hey, you know what, you've, you've had something happen. You've been through something that's traumatic. Don't go too crazy. You know, just, yeah, you're going to have to do it different. And yeah. I have a, I, I could be hard on myself with things like that. I feel sometimes like I should be doing more. And then it's like, well, Hey, I'm actually doing okay. Cause I'm doing a lot more than I thought I could be at the time, you know, or how far I am two years out, you know? Um, but I think the mental challenge was the hardest part of every, of everything with it was getting over the fears, the depression at times where you do feel down and, and it, and it's, it's a challenging depression because it's a reminder. Um, cause you've already. Mainly through the faced... recovery or yeah. is it still mentally challenging, you know, having gone through this for you? I think it's still mentally challenging at times, even today and, you know, doing things. It's not as often because okay. I've, you know, seeked help and talked to people and, and been open with my story, but there are days where you get up and it is a challenge of yeah, for sure. something coming up or, uh, something you wish you want to do, you know, like we taken family trips, you know, we, we traveled a lot with the kids before and then sprinkle COVID in there in the mix and everything. But then I've really wanted to take the kids on a trip somewhere. And my first thought is, well, that requires a lot of driving or getting on an airplane and I got to grab that monitor with me and figure out, you know, how that works. And in you travel, especially with, family and kids, it's just rush, rush, rush. I mean, you know, you're, you're always like it, it, your trip is when you get home after <laughs> so you get to relax. Right. <laughs> okay. So yeah. there's part of me that worries, like, what if something happens when I'm on vacation? Yeah, like, yeah, what yeah. if I have what I had before and it ruins the trip and my kids have to go through another event of, even if it's just me getting shot with the device, you know, something. So I think the um, loss of feeling like I can do things traveling and which I'm not saying it like I can't and I won't because I still plan on doing that. And I see myself more and more going to that point where I'm going to be doing more of the things before cardiac arrest. But it's just, it's a chore to get there at times, you know? And I think that wasn't what I was expecting when I think about it and look back at things. Like sometimes I thought like, um, like when I went back to work, you know, I took time off. I took as long as I needed and work was tough. Uh, the getting back was a struggle and I'm still struggling with it. You know, and having this event before was another fear of mine of maybe I'm not doing the right thing right now with my life, you know, and question, I'm asking questions of myself that I would never envision asking at 47, you know, you're right. I, yeah. At, at all. Right. And, um, I just remember the first week of coming back, it was so emotional mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm, I've been at my job for a long time, over 20 plus years, and I know a lot of people and they know a lot of me, they know my family, you know, and uh, it, I took breaks during the day where I went out to the car and I honestly, I just cried. I was so overwhelmed. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to feel, you know, um, I, at times I thought like, I just want to go home. <laughs> you know, I'm like, this is too much. I, I can't, I can't handle this uh, feeling of, I don't know, let's see gratitude because they're being grateful to see you but at the same time hearing somebody say like man we really thought you were gonna make it it's and so it's strange like, to hear this about yourself right right yeah and it's hard to process that because you think to yourself like well yeah i'm so grateful like like you think like if so, you hear some stories where somebody has a near-death experience and it's like you look at life like everything's rainbows and flowers and it's <laughs> like no, nah, it's not always like that. Nah, yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of pressure and stress and yeah, what yeah. ifs and, you know, a lot of things in there that you don't envision happening and yeah. it happens. Yeah. And the um, whole other side, right. That other people don't really go through just the worries, right? Like you said, yes. like it can happen anytime because it happened once. So we just, yeah, it also made me more conscious just about or more, more careful, uh, uh, way more careful. And that's uh, actually a very interesting mental challenge that not many people have to face, uh, luckily, yes. right? But that we mm -hmm. do face actually, yeah. Uh, but it's frustrating. And I, yeah, and last, I think it was last year, the suddencardiac.org 
website posted the the study about PTSD. Oh yeah, and yeah, and uh, That's I very was real. reading. Yeah. Yeah, and I was reading the story, and there was things in there word for word that I was going through, and I never put the pieces together because huh. I, I didn't really, you know, our trauma is unmemorable to us, but our body remembers, right? And um, I started thinking to myself, well, I get nervous going to places I used to go to every single day. I've gone to a, a store and noticed that there's more people than usually there, and I've left where I used to never do that, you know, and. I, I actually participated in this in the study and it was very beneficial. Oh, interesting. Um, and I realized that I was having issues with that. And yeah. I, I, you know, they helped tremendously with exercise and mindfulness, extra, just things that kind of get you through, you know. And I thought to myself, well, that was never even mentioned when you talk to somebody leaving the hospital that you might have these things, right? And again, yeah. I'm not blaming the hospitals because. Their job is to get us back and help. Exactly. You know, uh, they mm. can't like kind of hold your hand the whole time when you leave. But I'm like, man, now if I could tell somebody that's been through it as they win their first month, mm -hmm. that might help them down the road to realize that, you know what, you, you, it's hard to do it alone. And yeah. certainly don't feel like talking to somebody about it is a failure. It's good. And then you kind of do it to somebody that doesn't have a connection mm. because it's hard to have a connection with somebody emotionally because they look at you as their friend, their brother, their sister, whatever, you know, it's, it's a different opinion. And um, I felt like there was times where I needed it. I felt really good talking to somebody and going through something and hearing like a struggle is normal, you know, because um, I I think I mentioned before, I put a lot of pressure on myself. I'm one of those people where I feel like if I did something one day and the next day I can't, it's a complete failure. I'm mad. What am I doing? I'm, mad, you know, and it's like, no, that's normal. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're not going to be able to do everything at once. And there might be some things you might not be able to, and you can work on those, you know, um, it was down to something simple to running to a store, buying a Starbucks coffee and walking around the store and not feeling like I have to leave. Like that's how simple it was. That was a challenge. And I didn't put two and two together to feel like that's how much of a struggle like I was going to it through at a time, you know, that, uh, wow, I can't even go to a store and actually enjoy myself. I'm always feeling like something's going to happen or I don't feel right or something's off or I'm looking for who's going to help me if I do slump over and act like something's wrong, you know, and, and it was not the necessarily the fear of having the cardiac arrest again. It's the what ifs afterwards that was bothering me. You know, the, the after effect, it's like, cause I have a device, like I know this thing is going to save me. I mean, it's reassuring that they tell you that you're, this is your life, you know, life vest for another incident, but there's no, oh no, no, you're never having another incident. It's almost like when you have another one, right? That's how it's worded. And it's like, well, geez, what if I'm in the uh, express lane at a store and I feel this thing go off and I fall to my knees and I'm, you know, what's going to happen, you know, then. And so I didn't realize those struggles were kind of part of PTSD and part of feelings you have of the tra the trauma you've been through because let's just face it, they can hit you at any time and your mind doesn't even know it yet because I don't remember my trauma. So like for me, I drive up and down the street where I had it. It doesn't phase me whatsoever. I know it, I had it I, and I, my wife's pointed out exactly where we were, but I, it doesn't, I just remember, it's like, oh, that's where I basically died and came back, you know. Um, but like now for her, for a while, we kind of avoided that area. And I understood why she, she saw the trauma, you know, she, and she witnessed oh, it. Oh, yeah. Right. You know, for and then the that's where I started. Saving <laughs> us, right? It can yes. also be, it's really traumatic for them too. And especially if it's a loved one like you, for example. Yeah. So for her, it must be also. Yeah, go into that place. Uh, she avoided it for herself in a way. Yeah, and now she goes by it every day on her way to get on the train to work. And I'm so proud of her yeah. being able to do that, you know. And, yeah. and again, it was work to have her get to that point. And yeah. again, she was smart like me and talked to somebody and get some help because it's a big thing to take on. They have to deal with that, you know, and go through trauma like that. And then... You know, another thing I kind of learned, I'm sorry, I'm kind of jumping over, but one of the things I learned was survivor's guilt. I, I don't know if anybody's Survivor's already, guilt? Guilt, yeah. So, Oh, survivor guilt? Guilt, yeah. So, like, for me, 
I felt that with when I saw how my family struggled. I would feel so guilty that I caused that. And then when I started researching it and I realized that it's almost right around 10% survival and it's more don't than do, those questions of, well, why was it me? Why was I so lucky? You know, why, why am I okay to be able to kind of go back to life and do things and remember, you know, stuff that where there's others that didn't make it or they come back with a lot more other things that are effects from the cardiac arrest, you know? So that was a hard thing to go through as well. When you do have moments where you do feel guilt for having cardiac arrest, even though we didn't choose it, you know, but you sometimes feel like you were chosen to have it and survive. And then you see everything that everybody goes through and you're like, I don't want to bring that on people. You know, I, I don't want my, my, my family and my kids and them to always worry about me where, whether I'm okay or I'm out doing something, you know, like I just want them to look at me like I'm Jamie before the cardiac arrest, but I know that's impossible. I was also curious to just ask you, like, is there something that you wished your cardiologist, cardiologist would have told you like sooner or has there been some other like things that you discovered way later that you wished you would have also discovered like sooner that could have been helpful um, for other survivors listening? Like after the cardiac arrest? Like, yeah. At the, yeah. Um, I think one of the things I wish they, and I, again, I think it has to do with just the idea of what we went through is the fact of kind of talking to you about seeing somebody that you're going to want to get some of these emotions out and feelings and it because the nurses were great they always could talk about things and you know say like you know stuff going on but when the doctor shows up and i love my doc he's a great doctor so this isn't a, a bash against him but it's more about the black and white right it's this is what's going to get done this is what you're going to experience this is what the you know um it probably would have been nice to have a little bit more of the psychological side after survival yeah um, yeah. more of the, uh, ideas of getting help going like this, uh, the sudden cardiac arrest survivors page on, uh, Facebook it, trim. It's amazing to read some of the people's stories because it's, are there struggles? It's the same exact thing we've, most of us have been through are going through or maybe haven't faced. And, you know, um, a lot of that's not advertised to you when you're leaving or t even your follow-up, you know, you do your two week follow-up after the hospital. It's mainly, Hey, let's see how your scar is doing. Let's, you know, it, it, that kind of thing. Um, you, you almost have to pull out the human element of what you've been through. And that's why I do like my doctors. Cause I've had conversations where I've asked questions that I probably wouldn't have asked a regular doctor, but because of the cardiac doctor has a different relationship in my life that I've, I've asked that, you know, I've asked things and he's been very responsive and, you know, but again, I don't think that's for everybody. They don't have that relationship possibly with their doctor, but you certainly don't get that when you're leaving the hospital, because again, you're just kind of, you're going back to quote unquote, your normal life afterwards. Just the fact that, Hey, you, you died <laughs> and you're back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're better now. Go right, home. Exactly. All right. <laughs> You know, I mean, even yeah. getting on the soda low, I mean, I had a soda, I had to go to the hospital to have it given to me for a week. You know, I sat in a room and, you know, had to be monitored because one of the side effects is you're going to, you could go into cardiac arrest. Right. And, uh, just the weird feeling of looking into what the drug does, what it's you know supposed to do from here on out. And I felt like, okay, well, at least I'm getting some answers. That's how I kind of looked at it. Like, at least now I'm kind of moving forward in the diagnosis afterwards, because I kind of felt like something's going to have to show up at one point or another. I wasn't lucky enough to just have a bum little spot in my heart that wasn't working right to put me in sudden cardiac arrest. You know, something was wrong and going wrong in, in there, you know. But I know, like, you were mentioned that you've had some problems with your heart beforehand. Right. With your car. Yeah. yeah. And see, I, I didn't have any of that. So yeah. it was more of a like, wow, I didn't realize something was happening that was wrong. You know, Yeah, that's even scarier. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's either way scary yeah, it's for this to happen. Yeah, it's different type of scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we media were like, well, yeah, I mean, I, I have this heart disease from, from like they discovered it when I was like six years old. So it's been always there so very likely that he came from that but they're not even a hundred percent sure that it was because of the heart disease so but likely right it's likely it would have been caused by it but 
Sorry to interrupt. Uh, to interrupt. No, that's okay. Um, I think um, I really think the after fact of what you're going to go through emotionally would be nice to have somebody either there with some kind of background in it or even a, a survivor, you know, that could be there oh, as yeah. almost like a sponsor, you know, kind of like help you through it yeah. you know, a little bit would be nice. Right. Because it's a, it's a, a very traumatic event with very minimal survivors. And that's the hard part about it is, oh, yeah. is seeking other people that have been through it. There's not, and mm. it's globally that there's not many people that have survived it. You know, it's not just that, you know, in the, in the U S it's everywhere. It's a very, usually it's, you read the paper, Hey, the person passed away due to sudden cardiac arrest, you know, because you, whether you're home by yourself or the person you're with could only do CPR for so long before you got the right, you know, help or whatever the situation is, you know, it, it's very low survival rate. There's not many people like us, right, who survived it in the end. And I, I, I this is honestly the, the biggest reason why I started this project and wanted to do this podcast is exactly for that reason that you were just talking about, like the emotional support that was just that that i that no one almost seems to have received in a way mm -hmm. and like you said i also get it they want to treat you like for what happened to you and then get you kind of home and and you know because they have other people to look at so i get it but it's still like there's so much emotional like it's such a roller coaster <laughs> roller coaster such an emotional one that it's a bit weird that they don't focus a bit more on it to to just guide you through it because it's we're, it's up to us right. and it, it makes the whole recovery process and everything and living with it even more difficult i feel I, so i uh, yeah i tell a lot of people that i i see the world like have you, the, the matrix the movie right have you seen you've seen matrix the uh, movie i said when he yeah, finally sure, sees yeah. the matrix that's how i kind of see mm -hmm. the world today it's different everything to me is about a lot of gratitude and being grateful for things mm. because of the fact of almost having all that removed from you and that quick, right. you know, snap of the fingers. And I do believe gratitude helps emotionally a lot too, when you're grateful for things. Sure. But I just, I, that's the easiest way I can explain it to somebody to kind of understand that it's almost as if you see the world completely different. Some of it's scary. Some of it's very beautiful. Cause I've, put myself in places where I take a moment to stop and enjoy something, have a conversation. Like I mentioned, faith being in my life has been tremendous for me. Um, and those are all things that I, I, I give the sudden cardiac arrest gave me, you know, in a sense, it's kind of like if there was any kind of gift I can say I got from it was those type of things, because I do appreciate things that I took advantage of like everybody does. And I, I'm still guilty of it at times. I'm not perfect. I'm not going to, I, I think one person told me, you know, it's not going to be roses every day. You know, it's you're going to have struggles. You're going to have bad <laughs> yeah. days. You're going to have, you know. Um, but having something in your life and recovery is important. That's not necessarily uh, something you found, like something that makes you motivate to push through recovery is so important, I think, for people to see that and embrace it and know that it's okay to you know, have a moment in your day where you stop and you see something that you used to take for granted and it brings tears to your eyes. That's okay. Because there's some reason why you're feeling that it. It is beautiful, man. Yeah, that's, you're feeling those things for a reason, right? Yeah. So yeah. I, I don't... Because um, you were so close to never seeing or witnessing those things ever again, right? Yes, absolutely. Like you're mm. you're literally the, the saying that people used to say that you're one foot in a grave and the other in a banana peel. It's like that banana peel wasn't there. You were being pushed, <laughs> right? And it... And, yeah. and that was where um, faith came to me was when I started thinking about my situation and I go, there is no way somehow or another, somebody wasn't watching over me to make it. It's, I mean, it's, mm. a, it, it's impossible for me not to think that way because of the fact that there were so many variables for me not to make it, especially driving that I survived. And, Every one of those people who helped me survive, starting with my wife to the first responders to the hospital, that was my path to come back, you know. And um, it used to be really like emotional when I used to think about those that type of thing. And I'd break it down and kind of go step by step of what I had to go through to come through. And I go, I'm sorry, there's just no way I can't see that 
God's work wasn't in there somewhere. <laughs> like it, it's just there. And the fact that it, I, it was like the Bible called me, not me calling the Bible. Like it was there for me to read and, and, and feel like I'm getting something so much out of it that it was a gift in my, in my life afterwards. It, it put me in a place where it made me so peaceful. And, and so even parts of the Bible that are stressful and, you know, you scratch your head and you're like, oh man, what's going on here? But it still made me think of, wow, I'm so grateful to be here. And I'm grateful to be able to experience these things, you know, um, that gratitude has been huge for me. I, I think that's been one of my biggest changes is feeling grateful for just life and waking up and feeling that breath of air in my lungs when I get out of bed, simple things, you know, and it helps the soul. It does. It does help you heal. It works. Uh, I had a, I had a good friend of me of mine ask me one time, "Do you feel like you have to have faith to recover?" And it was a, it was a question that was a hard answer because it really made me think, and I still think about it now. And I, I explained it to, you have to have something. It doesn't have to be faith. It doesn't have to be God. You know, it has to be something. There's something that's got to be there to kind of give you that driving point to help you push through these tough times that you're going to go through. And because you're going to struggle, you're going to go through something and be like, man, today was just a day. Like you go to bed and that head hits a pillow and you think, man, I went through so much just to get to this point in my day. But yet I'm here to do that, <laughs> you know, opposed to the opposite. So, um, and that's something that it would be nice to see start at the hospital with some kind of idea of somebody to help you. When I heard your story and heard mm. you talk about things, I go, well, I know exactly, I can actually say, I know what you feel, right? <laughs> because I've been there, right? As opposed to, I mean, one of my, you know, when I was coming back and I saw help, the first thing that they said is like, I don't even know what you experienced, but it has to be something, you know, I, and again, they specialize in those situations and helping people going through trauma, but they never experienced it themselves. So they're kind of learning as you go. Right. So to have somebody sit there and say, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to tell you, I know exactly how you feel because it's different for everybody, but I did experience what you went through, you know, and that helps a lot to have that out there. Like you and me having this conversation helps me tremendously. Yeah. I've been looking forward to doing this. Same, same for me. <laughs> I, I was so yeah. thankful when you yeah. responded and said, Hey, go ahead, schedule something. And I'm like, this is great. This is, I've been looking forward to helping somebody with my story and hopefully helping others, you know, and it's kind of my calling now this to, even if it's somebody who didn't experience cardiac arrest and they just need to have somebody talk about survival and going through something traumatic, you can use it in so many different ways to help them. And I'm like, what better to take something that was so traumatic and turn it into a gift, you know, to help others. That is, I mean, the best way, you know, to move forward in life by actually finding some kind of meaning, you know, in the suffering, you know, that you've gone through and uh, yeah, doing something with it. It's yes. like helping other survivors or, or just sharing your lessons in a way or something with other people, right? Jamie, I want, I want to ask you a last question. Sure. Um, what is the best, you know, tip that that you would tell survivors, you know, people who just went through it, for example, or people who are struggling just uh, with it, or yeah, or is there anything that you still would like to let our survivors know? Well, when I went through the PTSD therapy, one of the things I had to do is write a narrative about my trauma. And it just, I, I, it, I couldn't think of anything because there was just so much. But then I realized that cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac arrest is part of us, but it isn't us. It's not to control us. It's our story. It is part of what may, it's, it's a bookmarker in our life to have a stopping point in a sense to start different afterwards. And there's going to be times where you're going to hate cardiac arrest and you're going to hate that word. It's at SCA. You're going to be like, oh, you know, I don't want, but it's our story and it's our story to to share if you're open to it, if some people aren't, and I get it, but you have to kind of embrace it in order to move forward with it because I control the cardiac arrest. It doesn't control me. And it took me a long time mm -hmm. to get to that point because for a long time, I thought that that was the one that was controlling 
my thoughts, my actions and things. Oh, I'm doing this because of I'm doing that, you know, and it was like, no, no, I'm doing it because I want to. And it just happens to be that I have cardiac in my a cardiac arrest in my my story, you know, and I, I think that's important to people to kind of know that and realize that it's part of us, but it isn't us. We're we're survivors to survive life and move forward not necessarily yeah. carry the cardiac arrest with you as luggage in a sense, you know, it's just a part of us that we, yeah, traumatic. Most people don't experience and I'm thankful for it because I don't want anybody to have to experience what we've been through. And that's one of the things I tell yeah. a lot of people is that I wouldn't wish it on anybody because it's scary, grateful. There's tons of things that come with it, but that's my story. <laughs> you know, that's, that's part of me and I'm not going to let it dictate what I, it does in a sense what you can and can't do because of the limitations of what you can do with the ICD, but it's not going to control me from being happy, sad, moving forward yep. and em embracing life. You know, um, if anything, sometimes I'm thankful because it makes me embrace life more. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. It's a wild journey. And I am so, so thankful, Jamie, that you took the time, uh, to share a little glimpse of your story, right? Because there's so much more, right? But there's a lot there. <laughs> I'm really grateful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really grateful that you took the time. Uh, it's been actually really helpful for me as well to hear this, uh, to talk to another survivor. And I'm sure that other survivors listening uh, will... You've shared actually a lot of great uh, insights. So, yeah, thank you. And that was my conversation with fellow heart warrior Jamie. I uh, hope you gained something from it, such as some tips and hopefully any much needed support. If you enjoyed this episode, then don't forget to follow the podcast so you can stay up to date when the next episode drops. Also, if you have any feedback or would like to share what you thought of the conversation, I am very curious to hear from you. You can share your thoughts in the show notes, which are located in the description of this episode. Uh, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Jamie to find the show notes of this episode. With that, here is to many more episodes and I hope I get to welcome you again, my fellow Heart Warrior, in the next one. Until then, this is Yelis Vaz, signing off. Before you go, I uh, just like to remind you of the Heart Warrior t-shirts and mugs I've created together with an illustrator. If you're looking for a fitting t-shirt or mug that will not only show the battle you fought and are still fighting, but also something for yourself to wear and use that will make you feel empowered, these t-shirts and mugs will be a great addition to your life. It certainly has been true for me. Additionally, you will also be supporting the Heart Warrior project which will help me to keep this project running. Now, if the t-shirts or mug doesn't speak to you, but you want to support the project, we also accept donations. You can find more info about all this by going to the description of this episode. There you can find a link to where you can order the t-shirts and mugs, as well as other ways to support this project. Or you can go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find this information.